Today, the title of the message is A Perfect Man. A Perfect Man. Lonnie said, that's him. I'm not picking on you. You're the one that said it. But, uh, amen. Well, I'm with you on that. Gary, too. All right, praise God. Anybody else? The perfect man. The perfect man. A perfect man. I was at, uh, they have a thing called Men's Encounter. Some of you guys have heard of and I was there one time uh, at, well, I went to the men's encounter twice, but I went to, afterwards, they have a group called Post, where some guys that, that went through the men's encounter all kind of come together uh, once a week, usually, or, or so, and, uh, and just kind of keep accountability with each other and, and to grow as, as the Lord's touched them during men's encounter. And there was one time, and I, I embarrassed all my friends I was sitting with, but somebody got up there to speak, and they said, who out here would dare to say you're perfect? And I'm like, me? <laughs> and they're like, oh, man, that's that Pentecostal guy, because they all knew, you know, this was a group of all denominations. Everybody knew that I was the Pentecostal guy, and I'm like, I said, come see me afterwards, and I'll show you the scripture. But anyway, I know what he meant. We're continuing right along in Ephesians 4, and today we're going to talk about a perfect man. Ephesians 4, and starting in verse 11, we're backtracking a little bit so I can have it all, the full sentences with the commas and all that in the right place. And it says this, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ from whom the whole body Joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That's where I want to end today. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you will help me to unpack what it means to be a perfect man, what, what that means, Lord God, what this scripture is talking about here. Um, Lord, um, just open up our ears and our eyes, Lord, to, to, to capture everything that you want. God, I pray that today as we look at your word, God, we will be changed. We will be transformed. I don't want to approach your word lightly. I don't want to approach your word ever, even in my private time, and not come away touched and changed, Lord God, because it's your word that I'm relying on, oh God, for my salvation. It's your word that I'm believing for my healing. It's your word that you said would never return void. Lord, it's your word that you said you placed above your own name. Lord God, we are standing on your word. And so, Lord, I pray today that this word will do its work and in a powerful way, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the Holy Spirit dictated through the Apostle Paul, and by the way, I'll just say as a side note, a lot of people say, well, this one's in, written in red. This whole thing's written in red, folks. This is God's inspired word, okay? It's all written in red. Now, there may be some special meaning to certain things that the Lord spoke specifically while he was standing there on the earth to the disciples, but the Bible says that it's all God's inspired word. Every, every comma, every period, the whole thing. As my friend in Minnesota used to say, I believe in the whole Bible from Genesis to maps. <laughs> So the Apostle Paul, dictated by the Holy Spirit, um, says that his servants, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors and teachers, would continuously serve the body until, among some other things that he mentions here, we all come to be a perfect man. Is that possible to be perfect? Another scripture that puts it pretty bluntly, Matthew 5, 48 says this, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven 
is perfect. Man, Jesus says you're going to be perfect just like the Father is perfect. That sounds like a pretty tall order. How about you? Do you think that seems like a, that's a hard mouthful to chew and swallow? <laughs> The answer to the question, can I be perfect, is emphatically yes, if we understand what God means by perfect. Obviously, God didn't mean we would never make a mistake, otherwise none of us can do what he just said for us to do, because we've all already fallen short of the glory of God. And sinned. In 1 John, it mentions, if anyone says that he has not sinned, he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. Okay, that's pretty darn blunt. He just calls us some. If you ever, if you say that you never sinned, you're a liar. Okay, you yeah, stupid liar. I mean, it just sounds like ooh, he just really hits you there. I'm not calling anybody here stupid, by the way. I'm just trying to emphasize here. But the word sin, as you might know, literally means missing the mark. That's like the the real. If you were to dig into the word, it just means missing the mark. Of course, the mark set by God. Can any of us say that we hit the bullseye? every single time obviously not and especially when we're still growing and learning we all started out as children one day right when a children starts uh, starts this world if you will do they come out walking and talking perfect no they still got to grow and learn they're immature still and so just simply by reason of immaturity we miss the mark because we just don't know some things. That's called ignorance, which is not a bad word. A lot of times we think of ignorant as someone purposely did something. It just means they don't know something. There's a lot of people that are ignorant about nuclear science, including me. I do not know how exactly how that works, but I believe it does work um, because there's things like nuclear energy and so on. So I don't know about you, but simply for the fact that Growing and learning means that you don't miss the mark, but that excludes me from being perfect because I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, and a disciple means a student, a learner. So that means if I have more to learn and I'm, I'm growing, then um, I obviously don't have it all together perfect in that sense where I never miss the mark. But as a side note, even though we're not flawless in our thinking and our doing, you're, you should be improving. Okay, I was wanted to, as I was writing this, I wasn't really going to teach on that, but I wanted to say that anytime I met people will get too comfortable and ease. Yeah, well, that's good then. I don't have to worry about the fact that I keep blowing it. You should be changing. You should be growing. You shouldn't be continuously missing the same mark over and over again in your life. God wants that to be changed, whatever that mark that you missed might have been. So to understand this word perfect, I want you to think of this, complete and lacking nothing. That's another way you can translate. Complete and lacking nothing. Remember last week, how much of the measure? We got the measure, the full measure. We discovered that God given us the full measure of grace, the full measure of faith. But the thing is, it comes in a seed form. So the level that we experience it is based on how we cultivate it. So... <clears throat> Just in that sense right there, it's not one of my points, but let me tell you this. We are perfect because he's given us the full measure. We're complete. We're lacking nothing, but we seem to experience lack. We seem to experience that we're short of something. And so today what I'm going to do is look at three ways that we're made perfect in Christ. Number one, we have the perfect teacher. Okay, if we're going to be perfect students, we've got to have a perfect teacher. We all know the story of the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus and said, Good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus responded, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but only God is good. The young ruler, of course, was looking for something that he could do to be righteous, but Jesus essentially wanted him to understand it's not what you do, it's not what you know, but it's who you know. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Because what did he tell him? He said, this one thing you're lacking, blah, 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 do this. He said, but drop everything and follow me. So Jesus brought the attention to, it's not that you're not following all these commandments, good, rich young ruler. It's that it's about me. 
It's about being with me, the good teacher. And actually, he kind of answers the question that he had, um, or that he, he proposed. It was a hypothetical, where he said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. But I'm telling you, follow me, because I'm God, is what he was secretly saying there, if you were, if you were to follow that. So, <clears throat> verse 13, in our chapter here in Ephesians, kind of says that. Verse 13 Part of it says, till we all come to the knowledge of the Son of God. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Till we come into knowledge of the Son of God. This doesn't mean knowing about God. A lot of people that say that they know, well, I know God. Yeah, yeah, I went to Sunday school. I, you know, but I'll ask them questions. Well, what's he been saying? And then I get the deer in the headlight stare. And I know that they haven't, at least they're not having a good connection because um, God is speaking to them. God is leading them. God's the good teacher. He's with us. He never leaves nor forsakes. We should be hearing from God on a regular basis. And so knowing God doesn't mean knowing about him. It means knowing him intimately. I saw a bumper sticker. Maybe you've seen this that said this. I think it's up here. Yeah. No Jesus. And oh, no peace. No Jesus, K-N-O-W, no peace. See, there's a difference between do I, do I have Jesus or I do I don't. He makes a difference in my life. He makes me perfect is what he does. So there's two ways that we have access today to the perfect teacher. Number one, as I alluded to in my prayer before we started, is the perfect word. The perfect word. If you know God's word and you walk it out, you will not miss the mark. It, it kind of alludes to that here in our chapter, chapter 4 in Ephesians, verse 14. It says this, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried away by every wind of doctrine with the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceit. You know, just getting led astray, being easily twisted by people and they're plotting. But when you know God's word personally, intimately, you will not be susceptible to trickery or deceit. There's times when people come up to me and they just start telling me, they'll put like two, three, four scriptures together, but something inside of me is just like, that's not right the way you're trying to say it. You're just twisting this around a little bit. I know God's word and it also, that's what Jesus did. The devil said some scriptures, but Jesus said some more scriptures that showed that your scripture is twisted. This scripture is over and over again in the Bible and we got to know God's word. I am up here preaching and teaching. And I want you to know I pray. And I pray in tongues every single day. Lord, give me what your word is. I need this, God, for your people. But I can't study to show you approved. You've got to study to show the Bible says yourself or thyself in the King James approved. I can't do that for you. Okay, that's a personal scripture right there where it says study to show yourself approved. <clears throat> yes, I do got to stand before God and give an account for what I teach and what I preach, but it's not going to save you. That's for me. That's for my personal judgment there, okay? So, verse 15, another portion here says, speaking the truth in love. Well, God's holy word is truth. No matter our opinions, feelings, or what this world might tell us, or traditions even, I might add, if we stick to speaking God's word, we won't stumble. You might sound a little obnoxious to people that don't like it when you're always talking God's word, but I'm telling you, especially the world, they don't want to hear, well, the Lord said, you know. But <clears throat> if you use some wisdom, you can put it into normal terms, and then they'll think that, man, you're just a smart person. You're thinking, I ain't that smart. I'm just quoting what God said. You know, it's kind of a little cheat, by the way. If you want to seem real smart, just say what God says, and you'll seem real smart. James 3 and 2 says this, and I preached through this chapter a bunch. Remember the bits in the horse's mouth and all that about words? But it says this, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, in what he says, he's a perfect man. Perfect. Able also to bridle the whole body. When I was younger, I used to really be into some martial arts. And um, I did a number of styles of martial arts for many years. I know you wouldn't notice now because I'm not kicking and jumping around or nothing like that. Um, but I can. So I still can do it. I can still do it. <clears throat> My karate, we had a karate teacher <clears throat> at our uh, former church up in Minnesota, New Beginnings Church. 
And um, he was about maybe 67, 68 years old, and he was teaching this class called Karate for Christ. And he said, some, one of his students came up to him, kind of smart Alex, said, can you still kick, in the head, kick somebody in the head at your age? And he said, yeah, I can. It just takes two kicks. I kick here, and then when you drop down, then I kick here. <laughs> he said, it takes two, but I can still kick you in the head. Okay, so I'm kind of starting to work on that myself. I'm trying to keep him below the waist, below the waist kicks. Um, but the reason I got onto that, I was going to share something else, was that when I first read this, and I was really studying God's Word years and years ago, I used to joke about karate. I don't need to practice no more karate because it says if I can get all my words, I can bridle my whole body. So all I got to do is get my words right, and I expect a black belt. Thank you. I will be here to pick that up on Tuesday. <laughs> but, of course, it's not easy necessarily to get our words right. But the first way that we can uh, have the perf access to perfection through the teacher is through the word. The second way we have access to the perfect teacher is we have the perfect helper. And, of course, meaning the spirit. John 14, 26 says this, But the helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you, I want you to get this, all things, and bring to your remembrance, here it is again, all things that I said to you. He's going to teach you all things, and he's going to bring to remembrance all things. That's a lot of things. All is a big word, but God doesn't just make a boast like that and not mean it. God means what he says. Again, <clears throat> God's word comes in a seed form. Here it is. It's in a seed form. To the, to the degree that we water it, that we cultivate it, that we understand what it says, it will produce what it says in our life. But do you know what it says? That's the word. But we have a helper. Thank God. And he's going to remind you of these things. The Holy Spirit is better than Google search. And I'm a person that uses Google search. Not only does he continuously teach you, but here's the thing that Google search cannot do that the Holy Spirit does. He gives you the right words at the right time. You know, there's a lot of words that God has spoken, and they're all good in their time, the Bible says. Everything has its time and its season. Doesn't the Bible say that? Sometimes people got a lot of word, but they keep bringing it up at the wrong time, and they're not blessing anybody. They're just spanking people with the word of God instead of being a blessing. We need to know how to use the right word, but at the right time, if we want to be perfect, if you could say it that way. We can be perfect because we have the perfect teacher. Secondly, we can be perfect because we're perfected in love. Number two is perfect in love. Verse 13 says this, till we all come to unity of the faith. I'll explain about how unity is related to love in a minute. Verse 15, we speak the truth, I mentioned earlier, how? In love, in love. And then in verse 16, it gives a bigger explanation, but check this out. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, meaning every individual part, every individual joint supplies something according to the effective working by which every, again, I want to say individual part does its share, causes growth of the whole, the unified body for the edifying of itself. And here's those words, in love. It's later on in my notes, but I think I should have put this earlier, so I just want to say this. God is love. So when you say love, if we're talking about God's kind of love, then we're talking about everything that we do in Christ or in the Spirit or in God. That's what it means to be in love. To the degree that we say no to the flesh and we say yes to the Spirit, which is love, then we are perfect in love. It's, it's there. It's available for us. We're not missing any um, supply, any opportunity. It's all right there, but it's, it is up to us. Are we going to walk in love? See, in the flesh, and I'm just going to interact, I'm going to interchange the word love here with spirit, okay, because they're one and the same. In the flesh, we're all individuals, but in the spirit, 
we're all one. In the flesh, this is my body. In the spirit, we're all one body, aren't we? We're just one body here, Christ's body. In the flesh, we all have separate thoughts and opinions. In the spirit, we're all in one accord, the Bible said. And with one mind, the Bible said, called the mind of Christ. See the difference there? When we're perfect, when we're in love, it's all one. God is love. So being in the Spirit means to be in love. Can I say boldly, the Spirit is grieved when we're wanting to operate in Him and calling on His name and declaring that I'm a Spirit-filled believer and yet we're not walking in unity or love. He's grieved. That means He pulls back. That means He says, I can't be a part of this. I don't put my hands on that kind of stuff. I put my hands on people that are walking in love, that are willing to crucify flesh and say, for the sake of the unity, for sake of the group, I'm willing to just be in unity and love. <clears throat> if the Spirit and the Word is our standard, and of course He is, then consider our unity and oneness in the book of John. I love to go here, John uh, 17. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer. And just imagine this for a minute. This, if we could get a hold of this, it's so powerful. This is so hard to wrap carnal mind around. This is a spirit thing. We can't get what he's saying here except through a spirit, the Holy Spirit, through love, through just total surrender, falling in love with and looking upon the face of Jesus, forgetting about the world for a minute. And when we do that, we can understand this, but this is powerful. This is awesome. This is cool. We got to read this. John 17, 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that's us, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be one in us. Just the same as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one, that we would also be one, and not just with each other, but also in us, he said, meaning with the Trinity, we're also part of the Godhead oneness thing going on there. I'm not saying you're God, but the Bible does say, didn't I call them gods with a small g at different times in the Bible? And it's a, it's a whole subject I'm not getting into today, but I'll tell you, we're made in the image and the likeness. You're deeper waters than you think you are, okay? You have an eternal spirit, that was, but you are created. You're not eternal in the sense that you had no beginning or end, but we don't have an end. We just have a beginning, okay? That... So he says, let me just read that one more time. They may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. You mean our unity has something to do with the world believing that Jesus is who he said he is? Go figure. That if we would be one, the world might believe that God sent Jesus. Wow, that's a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. But it's not that hard. It's just called give up and say, God... I'm yours. I want to do it in love, in oneness, whatever that looks like. Verse 22, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. Wow. The glory that he gave Jesus, I have given them, us, to the degree that we're willing to walk in the Spirit and in love instead of in the flesh. If we walk in the flesh, there's no glory. If we walk in the Spirit and in love, the glory of God shines all over us, just as if Jesus was in the room. Pretty cool. That they may be one, just as we are one. I and them and you and me. I always get this part as I've read it over the years. It's just so, but if you went real slow, it ain't too bad. I and them and you and me. And here's this word that we're talking about today. That they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you. Meaning that Jesus loves us. I think that's right. And that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them. Sorry, I have to go to the next verse. As you have loved me. That's on my next page. That God loves us just as he loved Jesus. Why? Because when we're walking in the Spirit, we're walking in love, there's really no difference. We're all part of the same family, if you will, kingdom, 
so many ways to look at it, but we are now one. I know it's a mystery. How is Father, Son, and Spirit three distinct persons, and yet the Bible says there is one God. I don't know exactly how that works perfectly, but I know this. Somehow, each and every one of us, with all of our differences, we all like different things. We all like different food. We all, like, we all look different. We're all more or less handsome, starting... No, I always like to make jokes. Starting with me, I'm at the top of the ugly pile, okay? <laughs> and then working our way down. But here's the thing. Somehow... We're the divine body of Christ. We are actually all one. The Catholics have a way of saying that. I forget exactly how they word it, but you know what? Actually, they're, they're, they're right. They talk about the, uh, oh, I should have wrote this in my notes, but I have a Catholic friend that me and him would sit there and debate and, and, and be friendly to each other at the same time. We're friends. But um, he would talk about the mystery of the body of Christ, the divine um, supernatural body of Christ, meaning all the believers, and it's like, that is a crazy mystery. Somehow a Chinese person on the other side of the world worshiping God right now in an underground church is one of the cells of the body of Christ, and he's my brother. And I can't even speak his language, but we can both say the same word, hallelujah, and we can both talk in an unknown tongue, and somehow we're both connected through the Spirit. But in the Spirit, we're made perfect in one. Remember, perfect here means complete Missing no parts. That's why it's important. We got to have every, every piece, every part. When we're talking about unity within the body of Christ. So we're made perfect because we have a perfect teacher. We're made perfect because we're perfect in love. And then we're made perfect because we're a perfect reflection. Verse 13 says this. To a perfect man, halfway through the, the, chat, the verse... To a perfect man, we become to that perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So perfection is found in the stature and fullness of Christ. And I want to talk about that in the sense of a reflection. <clears throat> All the married couples did this at one point in different forms and, and stuff, but I remember years ago, in the, the year of 2007... So I got married in 2008, but I remember in 2007 doing a little bit of ring shopping. Anybody ever do any wedding ring shopping? We went out and we were at a mall and we were looking at the store, you know, and we, I went in there and I was trying to be slick. Hey, which ones of these ring, what, what do you like? You know, and I'm like taking notes because I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> didn't want to have to come back and try to remember. I, I looked at the jeweler and I said, give him the wink. I mean, whatever she likes, you write it down because I ain't going to remember. <laughs> so... And we were looking at stuff. Um, you know, there were so many options, I remember, as we were looking at rings. There was the right style. You know, do you want a single? Do you want them spread out? All these different things. There was the right size. How many carrots? I didn't want to get something that was like a quarter carrot that was like she'd not be happy with. But, you know, then there was the other thing, the right price. And so that's where I was like, well, she, she might want a full carrot, but we ain't going there. We're going, we ended up going, I believe it was five-eighths or three-quarter carrot is what we ended up going. And I, <clears throat> I had to pay it off in payments, too. I wasn't able just to buy it all in one big shot. So, But there was all these different things when looking at the rings. There was, like I mentioned, the different shapes that they're cut into. I, I was just looking some of this up in research, and there was about 20, 30. I, I didn't write them all down, but here's a few. The heart cut. It actually is cut like a little heart. The round cut, which is what Brenda got. The oval cut. The emerald cut, which is like a rectangle with these different shapes on it. Princess, marquee. There's all these different ring cuts. However, the shape is not necessarily what makes the diamond more valuable. It's the quality, actually, of the cut. In the world of diamonds, the highest level of value is called, coincidentally, the perfect cut. They use the word perfect. And a perfect cut diamond has precise proportions in its size, and it's also cut to perfect angles. Why? To allow it to reflect light. And when, it, when a diamond reflects light in this perfect cut, it's what they call maximum brilliance. According to my research on that wonderful thing, Google, this precision is found in less than 1% of all diamonds are considered to have a perfect cut. 
to have that brilliance. The term brilliance, by the way, it's a technical term. It's actually a jeweler's term, the brilliance. They talk about the color, the shape, the carrot, the this, and brilliance is one of those terms that they look at in there, which means how well it reflects light. Hear me. Perfection is not how flawless you are. It's how well you reflect the light. That's what being perfect is all about. Jesus said in John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Jesus spoke to them. He said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen. Amen. It's not our light. It's God's light. But we are the body, but we the body, excuse me, <clears throat> are all together and with him one. So how can we be perfect? <clears throat> well, we have the perfect teacher through his word and the spirit. We have God himself who is perfect love and he draws us together as a body in unity and that love. And then we can reflect the perfect light. So is it possible to be perfect the way that God means it? I'm telling you, it's absolutely possible. We can be exactly what... God wouldn't have said, be, be perfect even as my Father is perfect if there was no way to do it. But we get hung up so much on uh, things and stuff. Might just steal a little bit of that real quick, but... Uh, my buddy Tommy Riley, I'll give him the credit, sends out a devotional every day that I get. And he was talking about love the other day. And he's, his title of his uh, little post was called Love and Stuff. And he said, essentially, I'm going to have to paraphrase because I don't got it written down here. But he said, this is really good though, I, I grabbed a hold of this. He said, you know, when you first started going to get married, you remember how you didn't care anything about stuff? All you cared about was the one that you loved. It was like, I don't care. Just let's be together. You sit, maybe if you're like me, a product of the 80s, you'd sit on that phone where you had the extension cord or whatever that would reach around court, corners or rooms and you'd be in there talking to your girlfriend and then you'd be like, hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. And you, the whole thing, all you wanted to do was just talk to them. You know, you didn't care. You know, um, you know, just... But when you fall out of love, how many have seen this? Couples that are going through a divorce or something, all of a sudden it's about what? The stuff. I want my boat, I want my car, I want the house, I want this, I want that. Love is not about stuff. Love is about the people, and it's about God. Falling out of love, it becomes about the stuff. We need to make sure that we're walking in love, reflecting God, because God loves people. God loves you. God loves his church. And he's looking down at us, and he wants us to be a reflection of his body that the world might believe that Jesus is the one he sent. Could I have the ushers come up for our communion today? Hallelujah. There's no better way to really celebrate that oneness, that unity, and the perfection of being part of the body of Christ than we get to participate in the body and the blood.